Hi, my name is Joseph Chen, and today I'm going to be presenting a podcast on gastric bovulus. First, let's go over some brief history. It was discovered during autopsy of a woman in 1866 by Bertie, an Italian physician, and the first successful operation done on gastric bovulus was in 1896 by surgeon Dr. Moritz Borchat. Just some general notes: barium contrast and omnipig are used. During fl- fluoroscopy, to find gastric valvulus if there is one,、uh, gastric valvulus may result in bowel strangulation, and the pre-procedural fatality rate of valvulus is 50 to 80 percent, while post-procedural fatality rate is zero to 20 percent. There are actually two main types of gastric valvulus. One is organoaxial gastric valvulus, and the second one is mesenteric coaxial gastric valvulus. From the diagram here, we can see that the stomach is labeled in green. The axis is the black line, and the arrows show where the stomach will twist. Since organoaxial gastric valvulus was mentioned first in the previous slide, we'll start in more detail on organoaxial gastric valvulus first. So, in this enlarged diagram, we can see the stomach is still in green, and the axis on which the stomach turns connects the pylorus and the gastroesophageal junction. And from the arrow, we see the antrum twist opposite of the fundus, and thus causes the greater curvature. To move from a left inferior position to a right superior position. So just to clarify, the axis on which the stomach rotated was also called the longitudinal axis, and as we said before, the greater curvature moves to superior and the right, while the lesser curvature will flip over too and become inferior and to the left. Organoaxial gastric valvulus occurs in 59% of all diagnosed gastric valvulus cases, so it is considered the most common type. I will show you a case of organoaxial gastric valvulus. But first, we will go through some history of this case. The infant in question is eight days old, with multiple congenital anomalies and constant spit-ups, with an inability to pass a nasal jejunal tube. So, in this KUB, we see an airfill structure located with blue arrows. This is actually the dilated esophagus, which is suggestive of gastric outlet obstruction. We also see that this infant suffers from congenital heart disease and heterotaxy, as the UVC is located on the left and the UAC is located on the right side of the aorta. In this upper GI of the infant in question, we see a very dilated esophagus on top. We have a stomach filled with barium contrast, as seen with white, and we have a pylorus to the upper right of the stomach. As of now, we can't really see that this is a case of organoaxial gastrovalvulus. But once we go through the symptoms, and we will come back and reevaluate this picture, and it'll be much easier to see. So symptoms symptoms of organoaxial gastrovalvulus include the well-known Borchardt triad, which consists of the inability to pass a nasal gastric tube through the stomach, the urge to vomit without any physical expulsion, and general upper abdominal pain. Symptoms may also include hiccups or sharp left chest pain. Now that we know the symptoms of organoaxial gastric valvulus, we can come back and reevaluate the picture we saw from above. But this picture is a bit varied because there's an addition of two tubes: the nasal jejunal tube and the nasal gastric tube. The nasal jejunal tube is indicated by the black arrows, and the gastric tube is indicated by the red arrows. If we follow the nasal jejunal tube first, we can see that it gets caught up in the esophagus, the very dilated esophagus. And if we follow the nasal gastric tube, we see that it goes through the esophagus, goes through the fundus, but it gets tangled up in the greater curvature of the stomach. And as we've seen from above, the symptoms. This is one of Borchardt's triad symptoms, and thus this is suggestive of organoaxial gastric valvulus. Moving on from organoaxial gastric valvulus, we will now talk about mesenteric coaxial gastric valvulus. From the enlarged diagram here, we can see that the stomach is still in green, and The axis on which the stomach twists is bisecting the greater curvature and the lesser curvature, and from the arrows we see that the antrum moves to a superior and anterior position, which is contradicting from what it was before, which is posterior and inferior. To clarify how the stomach twists in mesenteric coaxial gastric valvulus, imagine that the stomach folds in on itself like a clamp, and in mesenteric coaxial, the twists are not full because it is always incomplete. And this can happen intermittently, and it's usually not related to diaphragmic defects. Mesenteric coaxial gastric valvulus occurs in 29% of all diagnosed gastric valvulus cases, so it's less common than organoaxial gastric valvulus. As for symptoms, 
Symptoms of mesenteric coaxial gastric volvulus include abdominal fullness after each meal. A meal may consist of a normal meal or just a bite to eat. There will also be chest discomfort, there will be a burning sensation, and it may be misdiagnosed with peptic ulcer disease. So here is a case of mesenteric coaxial gastric volvulus. We see two pictures here. The one on the left is the schematic of the one picture on the right. The picture on the right shows the outlet, which also consists of the antrum. It's shown to be superior and anterior instead of inferior and posterior. Here are just two more cases of mesenteric coaxial gastric volvulus. You can see here that the esophagus in the left image has been dilated, and we have seen that both outlets here are shown to be superior and anterior. Although I did mention that there were two main types of gastrovolvulus, there actually is a third one, which is just a combination of both organoaxial and mesenteric coaxial combined. This happens rarely, and it happens in about 12% of all gastrovolvulus cases. So what actually causes gastric volvulus? Well, gastric volvulus is classified into two types of causes, type 1, idiopathic, or type 2, congenital or acquired. Type 1, idiopathic, constitutes about 66% of all gastric volvulus cases. It refers to the abnormal laxity of the gastric mesentery. And this is seen more prevalent in adults rather than children or infants. As for type 2, congenital or acquired, this constitutes about 33% of all gastrovolvulus cases. It is hereditary and refers to the abnormal mobility of stomachs. This is more prevalent in infants than adults. So what congenital defects result in a volvulus? Well, we can see from the chart here that defects regarding diaphragm and gastric ligaments make up for 75% of all type 2 gastric volvulus cases. What this emphasizes is that the volvulus is indeed a defect regarding abdomen and chest cavity. But the other defects, some that are not located in the stomach, serve to show gastric volvulus may be onset by other defects, not just the ones regarding stomach or chest. Going to depth on diaphragmic defects, one of the most important ones that causes gastric volvulus is hiatal hernia. It's a diaphragm defect that causes weakening in the diaphragm and thus allows the stomach to move up into the thorax. This is a prevalent type to cause and this is also a complication of gastroesophageal surgery. In reviewing our prior KUB, we can see that not only is this a case of organoaxial gastric volvulus, but also a case of parasophageal hiatal hernia. As I mentioned before in one of the first slides, the fatality rate of gastric volvulus after treatment is from 0 to 20%. So what exactly are these treatment methods? Well, there are two types. One is surgery, which is the most common type, and second is endoscopic reduction, which is still a procedure in its infancy. I will not go into detail on how the two treatment methods differ. However, I will talk about their goals because they are the same. The first goal is to have decompression in the stomach. The second one is to reduce the size of the volvulus. And third is the prevention of recurrence through the usage of gastropexy or hernia repair. In conclusion, I would like to revisit the points I find crucial to understanding gastric volvulus. First is the difference between organoaxial and mesenteric coaxial gastric volvulus. The main difference is the axis on which the stomach turns on. In organoaxial gastric volvulus, this axis is located longitudinal, while the axis in a mesenteric coaxial gastric volvulus case is one that bisects the two curvatures, greater and lesser. Organoaxial is the more common of the two types. Second, I would like to talk about Bolshaw's triad. Bolshaw's triad is one of the most telltale signs of gastric volvulus and should be looked for first. Third, the difference between infants and adult gastric volvulus cases. Usually, infants are diagnosed with type 2 gastric volvulus and adults are diagnosed with type 1 gastric volvulus. Finally, the treatment of gastric volvulus is surgical. Please visit our Pediatric Imaging Wiki site, http pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com for additional podcasts and also interesting pediatric and adult cases in all imaging specialties.